You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, I'm Mike McDaniel, the evangelist of the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. Welcome to a Bible answer. This program is seen on Fox 16, Jackson, Tennessee, Lions Club Channel 7, Carothersville and Hayti, WQWQ, the CW Network in Paducah, Kentucky. We reach a four state area, over two million people in our coverage area. We're thankful for each one who tune in a Bible answer each Sunday morning afternoon or night. We're thankful to have three great brethren who have done an outstanding job in answering your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. Hello, I'm Curtis Cates, Director Emeritus of the Memphis School of Preaching. Greetings, friend. I'm Gary Cauley, Evangelist of the Getwell Church of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee, and a teacher for the Memphis School of Preaching. I teach in the Memphis School of Preaching and preach for the Stanton Church of Christ. I'm Garland Elkins. Thanks so much to Brother Cates, Brother Collie, and Brother Elkins for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us today and answering your questions. We've had some outstanding questions these last few weeks, and we're looking forward to these questions today. Now to our questions for today. Our first question to Brother Elkins. Brother Elkins, must elders explain their decisions to the church. Brother Elkins. Well, that is a good question. In the first place, I mentioned that Hebrews 13, 7 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit to them, for they watch in behalf of your souls, as they that shall give account, that they may do this with joy and not with grief, for this were not profitable for you. And in Acts 20, 28, Paul said, and that he spoke to the elders from Ephesus at Miletus, and he pointed out to them the fact that the Lord had made them overseers of the local congregation. But they are not dictators, and they are supposed to serve the congregation. And the good question is, must they explain every decision? Well, I don't know that the Bible teaches that they have to explain every little decision. In fact, I don't believe it does, because they do have the oversight of the congregation. But elders do not write Scripture they merely are obligated to see that the truth is maintained, taught, and obeyed in as far as possible. And if they're going to be in a building program or go into some kind of evangelistic program that involves the congregation to a great, great degree, my judgment is they would be wise to inform the congregation. Furthermore, about elders in Romans, uh, rather than Hebrews 13, 8, remember them that had the rule over you and uh, considering the issue of their faith, the issue of their life, imitate their faith. Good elders will want to keep the congregation abreast of the work that is planned. By the way, the whole congregation does contribute, but elders do have the final say. Thank you for this good question. Thank you very for that very good answer, Brother Elkins. I was thinking about how uh, the flock should hear the voice of their shepherd in order to follow them, and uh, how much uh, importance there should be in proper communication between uh, elders and the congregation. Our next question to Brother Cates. Brother Cates, the querist uh, asked this th heart-wrenching question. I know the Bible says I'm forgiven, but they say my conscience says I am not. Uh, what shall I do? Here, here's a person, obviously, who is having a difficult time believing that he's been forgiven or she's been forgiven. They're, they're not forgiving themselves, maybe, when they've had the forgiveness of God. Well, I'll give you that question, Brother Cates. Thank you, sir. And uh, this is a very, very thought-provoking question. Uh, sometime our consciences uh, bother us. The Bible says that one is forgiven when the person obeys the gospel, and yet sometimes we can't forgive ourselves. Uh, sometimes the way that we have been treated m might contribute to that, or 
the, maybe we couldn't please some folks in our lives. So, uh, should that cross over also toward our feeling uh, toward God? Uh, there are several things that, that we can do in a situation like this, I think. Number one, we can be thankful that the Lord gave us our consciences. Uh, they are evidence that we are made in God's image. We're not just advanced animals. We're made in His image. And uh, animals don't have consciences. I have uh, been bitten by dogs at times, but I don't think a one of them was ever bothered because he bit me. It didn't seem to trouble him. In the second place, one's conscience must be taught the truth. And, and you're probably aware of that. Because the conscience is designed to, to help us to obey the truth. But consciences sometimes can be mistaught. And if they are, sometimes we can do wrong and we don't even know it and our consciences don't even bother us. You know, a thermostat can have the temperature in a room wrong because the thermostat is misset. So we need to teach our consciences. Uh, in the third place, one needs to educate his or her conscience as to what to do to please God. In other words, what to do to be saved. We need to study the examples of conversion, for example, in the book of Acts. And we know that when we have done what they did, then we will be what they were. We will be forgiven. Notice the statement in Romans 8, 16. The Spirit Himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now please notice that the Bible, Paul did not say, the Spirit beareth witness to our spirit. But the Spirit bears witness alongside our own spirit to let us know that we are children of God. Back when I was a child, my dad would tell me something that I had to do. Now, I would know when I got that done. And he was pleased, and I was pleased. And I knew that I had done what he said. And so dad's words bore witness with my knowing that I had done it. And therefore I knew that I was pleasing to my dad. Let us do what the Lord says and we can know that we are forgiven. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Cates, for that good answer. So many people, I think, have a problem with that. Uh, forgiving themselves when God has already forgiven them. There is a beautiful passage, very picturesque language in the Old Testament prophets about how God has cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Such beautiful language. And someone said sometimes we need to post a sign out there that says no fishing. No fishing. Don't go fishing after those sins that God has already forgiven and cast into the depths of the sea. Our next question to Brother Kali. Brother Kali, this is another question that has to do with forgiveness, but this has to do with forgiveness relating to our fellow man. How often should I forgive someone who has sinned against me? Brother Kali. Well, this certainly is a question that bothers many people. How often should I forgive one who sins against me? Well, the simple answer is, as often as that one repents. You know, it's important for us to hear repentance because we can't forgive until one repents. God doesn't forgive a man until he repents, and neither can we forgive a man until he repents. When someone has sinned against us, we need to stand ready to forgive. Would you be surprised if I told you that question of the man or woman who sent this in is also in the text of the Bible. If you turn in your Bibles to Matthew 18, 21, 22, Peter came unto the Lord. He said, Lord, 
How oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Now, if you will know, the Jews said, three times is enough to forgive anybody. So Peter thought he would double that and add one. He said, unto seven times. But listen to the Lord's answer. Jesus saith unto him, I say unto thee, unto seven, not unto seven times, but until seventy times seven. In other words, forgiveness should be unlimited. One man said, don't ever sin against me because I never forgive. Well, that man had better never sin because unless he forgives, he can't be forgiven. Let's notice some passages together today. Mark eleven twenty five: when you stand praying, forgive. If you have all against any, that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses. In Matthew 6, 14 and 15, you have your Bible. It says, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. In Luke 17, 3 and 4, he said, Take heed unto yourselves. If thy brother sin against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again unto thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Now Colossians 2, verse 12 and 13, or Colossians 3, excuse me, verse 12 and 13. He said, Put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. I sometimes wish you hadn't put that last phrase there. Certainly we have been forgiven of greater sins than any we'll ever forgive in our fellow man. So he says, even as Christ forgave you, even so do ye. You know, forgiveness is man's greatest need from God, and it's also his highest and noblest achievement that he may have toward his fellow man. Is it not gross ingratitude, my friends, on our part to expect God to have mercy on us when we refuse to have mercy on others? Christians should be ready to forgive at all times, and especially when one repents of sins against ourselves or against God. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Brother Colley, for that good answer. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer to you a free tract. And our tract today is entitled, Could Humans Have Lived With Dinosaurs? Obviously, that's a question that's on a lot of people's minds. This tract will help you answer that. Or we have our free at Lesson Bible Correspondence course. You're looking there at Lesson 4, Faith and Works. If you'd like to have the Correspondence course, the tract, or both, are absolutely free of charge to anyone who requests them. Or to send us your question, just contact us. You may write us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may call our toll-free number at 1-800-436-436. 63, or you may email us, and keep in mind this is a brand new email address for us. This is a Bible answer at earthlink.net. A Bible answer at earthlink.net. Now back to our questions today. Our next question to Brother Elkins. Brother Elkins, do you believe that we are living in the last days? Brother Elkins. That is really a good question because it's discussed so often. In the first place, I mentioned this, that in Isaiah 2, 2 and 3, the prophet said, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now in Joel 2, the exact prophecy is made about the last days. On the day of Pentecost, when the church of Christ was established, uh, the day of Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ, Acts chapter 2, 
You remember there were some who said about Peter and the other apostles when they heard them speak in different languages, these men are drunken. But on the other hand, Peter standing up with the 11, not the 120, with the 11, said, you remember these men are not drunken as you suppose, seeing this is but the third hour of the day. But listen to this. But this is that which is spoken by Joel the prophet, and it shall come to pass in the last days. The last days began on that day of Pentecost of Acts chapter 2. I travel around from place to place, and I note signs which say, we are living in the last days. Well, that's not surprising. We've been in them about 2,000 years, and we will remain in the last days till the end of time. Then cometh the end, according to 1 Corinthians 15. The truth about the matter is nobody knows when the very last of these last days will occur. Harold Camping claimed that in 2011, May the 21st as I recall, the end of time would come. This is the second or third time he's made that mistake. Billy Graham's daughter was on TV recently and I happened to see it. She claimed in her generation and read what was going to happen before the destruction of Jerusalem as they all do, which we believe, but tried to apply that to this generation. But Christ said, Verily I say unto you, that this generation, what generation? His generation, the one in which you live, this generation shall not uh, pass away till all these things, everything's been mentioned prior to that, shall be fulfilled. The truth of it is, the last days begin on Pentecost. This is the Christian dispensation, the last period of time. At the end, will come the judgment. Thank you very much for this question. Thank you, Brother Elkins. Our next question, one, uh, a topic of interest to many people, to Brother Cates. Brother Cates, do demons possess people today as in Bible times? Brother Cates. I think this is a marvelous question. Thank you for sending it in. The first question that comes to mind is, what were the demons in Bible times? It's interesting that in the New Testament, demons are not specifically described as to who they were. And so what we must do is we must go back to the time of Christ and the apostles and see who the people then held them to be. If we notice the Greeks of the time, we find that the Greeks believed that when a person died, if he was a good person, that person became a good demon. And if he waxed better and better as a demon, he became a good God, small g. If a person here on earth died and that person had been wicked, then he became a wicked demon. And then if he waxed worse and worse, then he became a bad God. Okay? Now, what about the Jews? Well, Josephus said that the, uh, and he beheld, that the demons were departed spirits of wicked men. So both the Greeks and the Jews agreed to that. It is interesting that those demons had, had been here upon the uh, earth. Uh, they had lived here. And so consequently, uh, they had, when they were died, their souls went to Tartarus or their souls went to the Hadean realm. They, were gone, they went to torments. But God permitted them for a time to be loosed from the abyss, torments, to inhabit other living persons here on earth. Now, why is that? Well, the reason was so that God could, through Christ, the apostles, and others who had miraculous gifts, could demonstrate the power of God over the spirit realm. Now, some people think demons were diseases. No, they weren't diseases. And when we read from the gospel records, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we find that the distinguishing marks are there between the demons and uh, diseases. They were not angels because angels never took up possession in any other person. They certainly... <laughs> were not God. Now, they were allowed temporarily to be used by Satan to take over and control, even torment, those whom they inhabited. Now, if they were cast out for some reason out of a human being, 
in which they were living here, then they would have to return to the abyss if they couldn't find some person in whom to take up habitation. Now, in the next place, Jesus Christ stated that he beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. In other words, when he died, then he uh, laid the blow to the head of the serpent from which he can never recover. And so he saw the beginning of the end of uh, Satan's work, for example, through uh, uh, demon possession. Consequently, when the age of miracle ceased, then demon possession also ceased. Zechariah the prophet said this, when Christ's blood as a fountain would be open for the cleansing of people's sins, in that day saith the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets, okay, talking about the miraculous, the miracles, and the unclean spirits, that is, demons, to pass out of the land. Zechariah 13, 1 and 2. My friends, no demon possession takes place today. If they were still to possess people today, then that means that Satan would have superior power to God because God is not working any miracles today. Can Satan work miracles such as demon possession? No, that doesn't happen any longer. Thank you very much for this excellent question. Thank you, Brother Cates, for that good detailed explanation to a question I know that is on the minds of many. Our next question today to Brother Gary Colley. Brother Colley, is reincarnation biblical? Brother Colley. Reincarnation, as is given in the common usage by Webster's Dictionary, reads this way. It is a rebirth of the soul into another body. The doctrine that the soul reappears after death in another and different bodily form. Many people are subscribing to this thought today, but many people have not read their Bibles like they should because no such idea is taught or referred to in the Bible. Therefore, this has to be a figment of man's imagination and something that he has conjured up in his mind because he doesn't like to face death as being the final st stroke of this world. Yet Hebrews 9.27 says, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. He doesn't say, it's appointed unto man twice to die, and after this cometh the judgment. Or it's appointed unto man thrice to die, and after this the judgment. He said it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says, As in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive, you know, in Luke 16, we're impressed with the teachings of our Lord concerning Lazarus and the rich man. You remember that both of them died. They didn't come back as a duck. They didn't come back in the, in the form of another person. But one of them was in comfort, while the other was in torment. And it was such excruciating pain that the rich man, formerly rich, said, Listen, I've got five brethren back on this earth. Tell them not to come to this place. I've heard people say, well, if my loved ones went to hell, I want to go there too. No, my friend, you don't. You're not thinking. No, there's no reincarnation, and there is only one place after death. That is either to comfort or destruction. Thank you so much for asking this question. Thank you to Brother Cage, Brother Colley, and Brother Elkins for doing such a great job these past four programs and answering some outstanding questions. You know, as one considers what is involved in becoming a Christian, there, someone has said there are three important myths. They are admit, submit, and commit. Before one can surrender his life in obedience to the Lord, there's something he must admit. 
he must admit, I have sinned. I heard about an angel, uh, an Indian who was actually lost in the woods. I know you can't think that can't happen. But once an Indian was actually lost in the woods, and a white man found him, and he said, Are you lost, Indian? And the Indian said, No, TP lost. Well, he would not admit that he was lost. And so many people today will not admit that they are lost. But the prodigal son, uh, when he returned home, confessed to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight. And when we admit that and when we mean that, then we've taken a giant step toward God. And it's not enough just to admit that we have sinned. We must submit to the will of God. Matthew 16 and 24, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That invokes the greatest surrender possible. We need to live the words of the song, All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. And that leads one to obey the commands of the will of God without question. And nothing less will please the Lord. And after one has submitted and obeyed God's will, he's then a new creation in Christ, a new creature. He's ready to commit himself to the cause of Christ. Men of the first century were ready after their conversion to go forth for the Lord. They were like the prophet Isaiah who said, Here am I, send me. Isaiah 6 and verse 8. And though persecutions and threats and beatings and imprisonments and, and even death came to some of them, as long as they had life in their bodies, they continued to commit themselves to Jesus Christ. We ask, what about you today? Have you allowed these three to be part of your life? Admit, submit, commit. If you're not a child of God, would you be willing today to admit your lost condition? And as a penitent believer confessing Christ to be God's Son, would you submit to the command to be baptized to be saved? And if you've already obeyed the gospel, are you continuing to commit your life to Christ? Or maybe you've gone astray because you would not commit fully to the Lord. It may be that you feel yourself away from God and His will this hour. I hope that you would repent of sin and come back to the Lord while you have time and opportunity. Thanks so much for watching a Bible Answer today. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible Answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for a Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with a faithful Church of Christ in your area.